double slit experiment. Early on, I began to pluralize first person singulars, a most trenchant discovery. Eyes could do it all. Two bodies twining serpentine, an Hippocratic oath, arrow piercing hobbled knee, hair blown by an invisible wind, blinds you, I think, a face trying to look out, attached to a body, feverish, hands frantically waving, was the painting you made of symbiosis. I found it beautiful, which frightened you more than the painting. I still find it beautiful. You have returned to your family. Do you remember before you gifted bound maxims aurelian, decorated in birdsong, made tin cans I could whisper into? One said scram, the other see, a warning for future selves, spelling my name with slackening string. We became multiple through you. Suddenly, all movements were mine. You made a dependent of yourselves, underlined Emerson till scraps of text trailed behind, falling like flies on a cutting room floor. I ate them like breadcrumbs intimate the intimate inmates. I began to say no. It felt good. I said it louder. It felt good and horrible at the same time to permit disdain directed at. Relational interpretation, one plus one equals I, we quantified. Never felt enough. Shared possessions, thoughtless, irreciprocal, taking. Knobby limbs knocking, twinned torsos tightening. I still think you are beautiful. Ably able to enable the apt erect, but really, you are beautiful. In the midst, I began to reject desire, the banality that is not a stripping. Sometimes stood outside, distilled, became the beast, spoke in tongues, ours. You miss laughter, I forgot everything. Now we filter, call slow connections glitch house. Unfamiliar intonation, resident dissonance, reconstituted in the clay you fashioned, a face or two observed in, through which is always already after. Tricky particulars, particulate grace, prismatic prison, this mirror box of mind. Phase cancels. A crow laughs. Life refracts. some brave new words to get us launched on our remarkable gathering here today. So good morning and welcome to Rice University and welcome to Brave New Worlds, Who Decides? Research, Risk, and Responsibility. My name is Luis Campos. I'm the Baker College Chair for the History of Science, Technology, and Innovation here. And when I fire up my retrospectoscope in order to see into the past, I'm <clears throat> always fascinated that there is a whole history to the future. This is my occupational hazard. Benjamin Franklin once wrote to the chemist and natural philosopher Joseph Priestley in 1780, the rapid progress that true science now makes occasions my regretting sometimes that I was born so soon. It's impossible to imagine the height to which may be carried in a thousand years the power of man over matter. We may perhaps learn to deprive large masses of their gravity and give them absolute levity for the sake of easy transport. Agriculture may diminish its labor and double its produce. All diseases may be by sure means prevented or cured, not accepting even that of age, and our lives lengthened at pleasure even beyond the antediluvian standard. 
Oh, that moral science were in a fair way of improvement, and that men would cease to be wolves to one another, and that human beings would at length learn what they now improperly call humanity. What a striking invocation for our theme here today. We are not alone in our wondering what is the shape of the world to come, from the way that the world is going and how our scientific advances relate to the ethics of our existence together here on this planet. Promissory futures of brave new worlds have long been widespread by some of the most prolific authors and theorists of the age. In the realm of biology, these visions of engineered futures have a long history. From the California horticulturalist Luther Burbank, who was more famous than whoever was president a century ago, who said, we can go nature one better, to molecular biologists like David Baltimore, who also claimed we can outdo evolution, even as he raised important questions at the landmark Asilomar meeting that we'll hear about in our first panel. To our distinguished keynote speaker, Francis Arnold, who'll be speaking here today on the promise of directed evolution. In the worlds of data and surveillance, we hear so many claims that the new worlds of machine learning and data bring about what AI researchers and even the Wall Street Journal has called the alignment problem how to make sure that our discoveries serve us instead of destroying us, as one article recently said, or what others have called calibrating thinking machines to human values. In fact, just this kind of narrative frame was used to describe my own remarks on Houston Matters just a few days ago with this remarkable headline that I discovered is how it had been summed up. So we are familiar with these exoticizing claims for the cutting edge world of innovation and its implications. And when even someone like Google's chief executive calls AI, quote, more profound than fire or electricity or anything we've done in the past, there is a sense in which we might want to offer a dose of dousing familiarity to that constant surf of newness. We are familiar with the difficulties of adapting our engineering solutions to the humans who use them. Engineering is, of course, only as good as the humans who use it. And when I was attending a fascinating engineering leadership forum in Duncan Hall a few months ago, I couldn't help but notice these signs in the room nearby, highlighting the ways that the unforeseen unruliness of human behavior has long laid waste to our best laid plans. As Robert Sinsheimer once cautioned in 1975, let us not design a technology fit only for a rational, far-sighted, unerring, and incorruptible people. This is just as true when we think about ways to address and to adapt to our increasing world of climate change. As one New York Times article put it just last week, reflecting on our current moment of extinction panics, as they called it, the first step is to refuse to indulge in certainty in the fiction that the future is foretold. We need to think our way into other possible futures. As NASA historian Stephen Dick once put it, imagination is not to be trifled with, but constitutes a real force with real life consequences. Ralph Waldo Emerson said something very similar long, long ago. Science does not know its debt to imagination. And even the biologist J.B.S. Haldane argued decades ago that pictures of the future are myths, but myths have a very real influence in the present. And Haldane even went on to argue that this very idea of a better future for humanity, that genre of thinking itself, dates back to and was an invention of the Hebrew prophets. And he credited H.G. Wells for being at that time our greatest living mythologist. Wells is influencing the history of the future, though probably in ways in which he does not suspect, Haldane said. So uh, when I was on uh, the radio the other morning, as my voice was carried across the radio waves, I thought of a radio lecture that Wells had given in 1932 about the unanticipated futures brought about by modern inventions of communication and of transport. And he said things like this, there will be no distance left and little separation. You'll be able to see and talk to your friends anywhere in the world as easily and surely as you send a telegram today. Before another half century has passed, everybody, so to speak, will be on call next door. You cannot doubt it. For all practical purposes, he said, we've not even begun to think yet what we're going to do about this abolition of distance. We have let it happen to us, and we're going on as though it did not matter at all. We are all of us behaving as though there were no need whatever to adapt our lives and ideas in any way to these new conditions. But indeed, that adaptation is the most urgent need of the present time. It seems an odd thing to me, he said, that though we have thousands and thousands of professors and hundreds of thousands of students of history working upon the records of the past, there's not a single person anywhere who makes a whole time job of estimating the future consequences of new inventions and new devices. There's not a single professor of foresight in the world. But why shouldn't there be? 
all these new things, all these new inventions and new powers come crowding along. Every one is fraught with consequences. And yet it's only after something has hit us hard that we set about dealing with it. See how unprepared the world was for the motor car. In the case of the motor car, we have let consequence after consequence take us by surprise. We're abolishing distance heedlessly, recklessly. Isn't it plain that we ought to have not simply one or two professors of foresight, but whole faculties and departments of foresight doing all they can to anticipate and prepare for the consequences of this gathering together, this bunching up which is now going on, or what, of what were once widely dispersed human relationships? What one generation called prophets and another called professors of foresight, we might call futurists. For decades and even centuries, these questions then about science, technology, and society are never only technical questions. And so we began our event today with poetry, and we'll turn in a few moments to novelistic considerations of the future, and then a bit of history, and then we'll get to the science once we have some uh, further diverse frameworks in mind for thinking about innovation and connection. A few weeks ago, we had launched this conference with a pre-launch event with Professor Jim Endersby's remarkable lecture, lecture on the history of the future from about a century ago, with figures like Haldane's visions of the future and, of course, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World and a series of other now forgotten figures over the early 20th century exploring the limits and potentials of the mutation theory and how it tied in with techno-political hopes for human betterment and both how familiar and how different those narratives are for us today. And if you missed that lecture, never fear, it is uh, recorded and available on our conference webpage, and I strongly encourage you to take a moment to review it. This intertwining of innovative futures and cultural mythologies highlights how beliefs and frameworks structure the very ways that we uh, think about scientific and technological futures. And the walls of this building are inscribed with inspirational phrases to be a bridge between the world of ideas and the world of action. And we might ask, what futures are created when we all raise a meaningful voice, to quote the inscription on the walls, and especially when we don't agree. History, communication, governance, all these things become more important. Evidence matters, of course, and so does power and influence, and so does context and narrative and frame. And sometimes the world, the historical, social, complicated world, escapes our ability to model it, engineer it, or understand it completely. We need what Wells had referred to as both the man of science and the expressive man, or if I dare correct our professor of foresight, the woman of science and the expressive woman as well. We have a number of partners here with us today who I'd like to express my gratitude to. I'd like to thank first and foremost the organizing committee and the staff who helped bring this event to fruition, especially our hosts, the Baker Institute for Public Policy, where we sit here today, and our other partners across campus, the Friends of Fondren Library, the Woodson Research Center, Rice Dining, and Rice Cinema. It's also my pleasure to announce that Baker College, the first of Rice's residential colleges, is putting on its annual rendition of Shakespeare, what's called Baker Shake, and they've chosen for this year's performance, The Tempest, which first appeared in folio form exactly 400 years ago in 1623. And as I understand it, this play is the first time when the phrase Brave New World as a phrase enters into the English language. And so it seems only appropriate then to explore the complex relationships of knowledge, power, frontiers, people, new worlds, through the stage as well as through books. Performances will be on February 29th, March 1st, and March 2nd at 7.30. Tickets are free for all students and $8 for the rest of us. And since books or a book belonging to Prospero lay at the heart of the play, we thought we would include a selection of books from our speakers in an intellectual showcase near the front of our conference hosted by the independent neighborhood bookseller uh, in Montrose, Basket Books and they've very kindly offered to assuage your intellectual thirst for the topics we are going to hear about in this meeting, and they will gladly sell you some remarkable works written by some of our speakers and some other selections as well. You are in for an intellectual and a multi-sensory treat, what in another register of innovation jargon we might call a translational research partnership. We have poetry and literature, dance and cinema, all as part of the program, in addition to all of our wonderful scientists who are presenting. And as you've seen, there's also a culinary experience of brave new hors d'oeuvres that will happen tonight. <laughs> there's a particularly resonant food art installation coming tomorrow brought to us by another one of our speakers and the Balloon Collective, which is inspired in part by Brave New World's Soma, that pleasure-inducing substance prescribed by the Graham. You have all come from around the world, from around the country, from around the state, around the city, around the neighborhood, and perhaps most impressively of all, from all parts of campus to join us here this morning. 
Welcome to the 13th Delang Conference, Brave New Worlds. And now I'd like to introduce President Reggie DeRoche, Rice University's eighth president who oversees our nearly 9,000 students, eight schools, and more than 900 faculty. At Rice, he's also professor of civil and environmental engineering and of mechanical engineering, and he previously served as Rice's provost and before that as our dean of engineering. And the president's top priorities are to enable Rice to reach a new level of distinction nationally and internationally for impactful research, for award-winning scholarship, and for insightful creative work. And I can think of no more appropriate person to welcome you all to campus today than our very own President DeRoche. Please help me welcome him to the stage. Luis is right, sometimes it's difficult to get our faculty to walk uh, across campus. And there might be some here for the first time for this conference, so um, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you all and good morning and welcome to Rice and those of you coming from out of, out of town, uh, from another country, from another city, uh, welcome to our wonderful city of Houston. I'm thrilled that you're here today participating in one of Rice's most thought-provoking events. The Delang Conference has always explored uh, uh, matters of great importance and provided people with the knowledge and tools to better understand such issues in powerful and effective ways. As Luis described earlier, the focus of this year's conference is the future of bio biology and biological systems, the future of data technologies and issues of surveillance, and the future of our climate and urgent questions of global governance. What's especially exciting about this year's conference is that it, is that it highlights what work that's being done in these areas across many, many different disciplines. And it addresses these questions as not only scientific problems, but as an inescapably social ones as well, as highlighted in the question, who decides? Working together on big issues of our time is critical and is sometimes the only way to make a significant and lasting impact. I'm glad to see uh, the values of interdisciplinary research and scholarship being highlighted, and especially the approach taken in this conference, which brings together research, exploration, and outreach done across several of our schools here at, at Rice. I'm also proud to see a lot of the topics discussed here today and tomorrow has been a focus uh, of the research and scholarship right here at our university. Last month, Rice launched the Rice Synthetic Biology Institute, which aims to catalyze collaborative research in synthetic biology and its translation into technologies and tools that benefit society in medicine, energy, agriculture, and much more. The Institute will demonstrate how everyone benefits when the top minds in natural sciences and engineering collaborate at a leading uh, research institution. Uh, it will also draw global attention to the great work that's happening in our highly acclaimed uh, and highly regarded synthetic biology program here at Rice. In addition to a strong synthetic biology program, Rice has a comprehensive environmental sciences program that probes the interconnection between humans and the natural environment. The program fosters the critical thinking required to better understand the complexities of the human nature in a relationship the resultant scales of impact and possible solutions. Rice also has a top computer science program. The program has been involved in cutting edge research across various areas of computer science, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, cybersecurity, computer vision, robotics, data science, and much more. Rice is also home to an innovative new collaboration in science and technology studies, which brings the School of Humanities and the School of Social Sciences and involves faculty in history, philosophy, anthropology, and English, among many other fields. Faculty and students in these areas have contributed to advancements and analysis in these fields through publications, collaborations, and projects. Many of those faculty are here today and will be leading some of the lectures and conversations. There are many other fascinating speakers scheduled as well, including Francis Arnold, who was mentioned earlier, who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and is now a professor at Caltech. Dr. Arnold will be giving the keynote address later today and we'll talk about the potential impacts of directing evolution. We're honored to have her with us today. We also have two other keynote lectures tomorrow, the distinguished Margie Margill, uh, a leading expert on uh, rights of nature movement who is expanding our sense of justice in human relations to the natural world. And we will also hear from the renowned artist, Trevor Paglin, who known, who known to many of you for his pathbreaking work exploring the spaces and context of surveillance who will explore the questions of psyops and disinformation techniques in our contemporary world. 
What you will learn and experience at the DeLand Conference is due in large part to the generosity of CM and Damaris Hutspeth, who established an endowment at Rice in the memory of Damaris's parents, Albert and Damaris DeLang. The endowment has supported the DeLang Conference for more than two decades. The DeLang Conferences are held every other year and range broadly in subject matter and discipline. All are intended to bring Rice's top experts and major figures from around the nation and the world to focus on topics of great concern to society. By bringing together researchers from the natural sciences and engineering, the social sciences, the humanities, and the arts, with other professionals, experts, and all the rest of us in various local communities, we'll at least know which questions to begin to ask. In closing, I want to thank our speakers for sharing their knowledge. I also want to thank and compliment the Conference Steering Committee, chaired by Luis Campos, who is a professor in the History Department and affiliate member of the Rice Synthetic Biology Institute and the Baker Institute for Public Policy faculty scholar. Luis studies the history of science, technology, and innovation, and he is exceptional at viewing issues from a multidisciplinary lens, which is why you are about to experience a collaboration, collaborative exploration that involves not only lectures and discussion, but as you heard earlier, film, art, dance, and yes, yet even great food. Uh, so uh, there's nothing like this conference. So thank you, Luis, for your hard work, and thank you for the rest of the steering committee. Uh, thank all of you for, who've come from out of town to uh, discuss these important issues today. Enjoy your time on Rice's beautiful campus. Hopefully the rain holds off uh, till this afternoon you get a chance to walk around our wonderful campus. And I look forward to learning uh, about the ideas that follow. Thank you. Thank you, President DeRoche. I'd also like to convey a welcome at this time on behalf of Rice's Scientia Institute, whose interim director, Jason Hafner, is here with us today, and is, I imagine, just as keen to see what we've been up to in the programming as all of you are to experience it. So thank you, Jason, for your incredibly generous support for the vision for this meeting. I'd like to turn now to our first panel and to invite to the stage one of our distinguished guests, Michael Rogers, who's exemplified over the course of his career a generalist's abiding fascination with the world of scientific innovation and has often found himself on the front lines. He'll say a bit more about his path from uh, physics and um, creative writing towards journalism and futurism a bit later in our program, but I just want to mention briefly that I had happened to read his early 1980s novel, Silicon Valley, in Fondren Library on the very same day that a story about conscious AI appeared on the front pages of the New York Times, and that was kind of the plot of the book. So he's been living in the future for quite some time. And while a bit later this morning, we will ask him to time travel himself back to his 20-something self, reporting for Rolling Stone magazine on a legendary meeting in the history of biotech that's become a touchstone in thinking about research risk and responsibility. This morning, I've asked him to speak about the future from the future. And he'll be joined on stage in this introductory conversation by Professor Jeffrey Kripal of the Religion Department. And together, they'll explore a bit of Michael's more recent book, Email from the Future, Notes from 2084, available outside, which, and this was an entirely a serendipitous connection here, um, when I contacted Michael to ask him if he was interested in joining us, it just happens to explore exactly the same three themes of our conference here today from the perspective of 60 years in the future. Please help me welcome Michael Rogers and Jeff Kripal to the stage. Thank you for that kind introduction, and it's, it's good to be here in the present, uh, <laughs> as opposed to the future or the past. Uh, I'm going to read very briefly here. Um, the book itself is quite long, uh, but the, uh, the, the key element is, uh, during COVID, I decided that I wanted to write uh, an extension of a short story I'd done some years ago that had a cute little time travel element in it that I liked, but I took the story out. And it was sort of a dystopia. And I thought, my god, everybody is doing a dystopia. I just don't want to do another dystopia. And I ran across a quote by Oscar Wilde, who said, a map of the world without a utopia is not worth a second glance. And I thought, you know, I'm not sure that the world needs another utopia, but I do. <laughs> so I'm going to write one. And basically, the premise here is, what if, I mean, uh, 
my theory is that we pretty much know everything we need to know right now to make the world a safe, equitable, just place uh, over the rest of this century. All we have to do is do everything right. So the premise of the book is what would 2084 look like? if we did everything right for the next 60 years. It's told from the point of view of a 74-year-old man who's a, uh, one of the last Gen Zs born uh, about 10 years ago. And he's writing a history of the 21st century to his grandson, Luca. Uh, so I'm gonna read three quick pieces. Uh, there's a lot of character in it, a lot of story development. I've pretty much taken that part out, so. You'll need to get the book for that. Um, <laughs> the audiobook actually has a great actor, too. The audiobook is nice, uh, but I prefer paper. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is geoengineering. Um, and actually, I dedicate this to Shannon Nangle, who <laughs> I was writing this in 2022, and I thought, um, am I going out too far here? And I picked up the MIT Media uh, Technology Review and th there she was, one of their innovators, top innovators under 35. And uh, You'll see, it, this is about geoengineering. And the backstory here is that the world strike at the end of the 20s shut down most global industry as well as the internet until the corporate powers and the government agreed to launch the war on the warming. In the strike settlement, the governments were required to fund national service programs, renamed Universal Service, UNISERV for short, focused on resettling climate refugees, rebuilding infrastructure, and finally CO2 mitigation. So Aldous writes, after two UNISERV tours in New York City, I re-enlisted in 2032. I ended up living for two years in a work camp in what after New York seemed to me the middle of nowhere, empty desert a few hundred kilometers north of El Paso, Texas but it changed my life. By the early 2030s, the giant carbon capture and sequestration project, CCS for short, had started construction. The technology had existed for a decade to pull excess carbon from the air and turn it into plastics or building materials or even fuel for ships and aircraft. Before the strike though, the corporate powers told us that carbon capture was quote, too expensive. After the strike, the equation changed. Carbon capture was too expensive compared to what? Extinction? In Texas, we were building the Arrhenius uh, Carbon Capture and Sequestration Plant, named after the Swedish scientist who nearly 200 years ago first described the greenhouse effect. The plant would be enormous, 38 hectares of factory floor attached to a 400 hectare solar field. It was one of 300 carbon sequestration plants being built around the world, usually in remote areas of the middle latitudes where giant gigawatt solar farms could provide energy for the power hungry capture process. The construction crew is the typical mix of National Guard, military, and UNISER, but with an unusual number of union workers. Skilled trades needed for the capture plants were the same as in the fossil fuel industry, still unionized in the 2030s. The war mobilization was like, well, wartime. Supplies and equipment literally piled up in the storage facility, but with 24-7 work schedules, there was also consistent turnover. Cargo aircraft flew into the temporary airstrip several times a day, and big automated cargo trucks cruised in from El Paso in platoons of a dozen or so, two meters between each, at a steady 120 kilometers an hour. When the trucks arrived at our work camp, they would park themselves in an orderly row outside the gates. I'd dispatch last mile drivers for the tricky task of maneuvering the trucks within the camp for unloading. Then the last milers would steer the empty trucks back to the highway, point them in the right direction, and send them on their way. AI data and education. So Luca is four or five years old, the grandson. It's official. Next month, you, Luca, will be introduced to your capital T tutor. That's a big moment in a child's life, a coming of age triggered by a neural scan and the agreement of your teachers, usually around five years of age. Tutor will be your first deep relationship with an AI, other than chattering with Domo at home. Most kids accept tutors as if they're the most natural things in the world. Your tutor's face will look a bit like William, your father's tutor, but not exactly. Each student's avatar is optimized. That means a similarly gendered avatar based on one of a few dozen standard models modified with visual aspects of your parents and yourself. Uh, 
That's mixed with an equal amount of otherness, racial elements not present in your family. Both your father and I always found his tutor William's face and voice very calming and reassuring, and I am certain that you will have similar feelings for your tutor. Tutor observes the student's emotional responses, eye movement, pupil contraction, a whole series of clues. It also notes what subjects particularly intrigue a child. And so tutor patterns its lesson on each student's learning modes, innate abilities, and interests. It is as if one of the finest teachers in the world was permanently assigned to each child, customizing every hour of learning to precisely fit the student's nature and inclinations. Tutors stay in touch with their pupils throughout their careers. Pupils who thrive in the workspace provide useful data for schooling the next generation. And if a student has occupational difficulties later in life, tutor can suggest alternatives. I was in my early 40s. Your father was two when I got my first and only tutor, primitive as she was. I wanted to be able to teach your father a bit of reading myself before he met his tutor, although I was quite dyslectic and not much of a reader myself. My reading tutor was named Alice, and she was very limited compared to what you'll have. No avatar, just a friendly synthesized voice. And she wasn't formally called tutor then. She was simply high-level AI designed for adults who had never mastered reading and writing uh, in early schooling, which was an unfortunately high percentage of my generation, since most of us had studied at the collapsing public education system surrounded by video distractions. Alice was humorous, patient, and extremely observant. She made up assignments based on my daily life, helped me through spelling and punctuation. After the first few weeks, I looked forward to my daily meeting with her, and of course, I could always call on Alice whenever I was reading or writing on my own, and there she was looking over my shoulder. Alice consistently tracked my eye movements and recorded the ways my reading went astray. After she had two months of data, she created a customized font set to install on all of my devices called Aldus Modified, which 35 years later, I still use. And then finally, genetic engineering. Um, he's having dinner with his uh, uh, son and daughter-in-law. And Sophia, I noticed, wasn't drinking wine that night. And when I asked, she presented the news. Luca, the grandson, is going to have a little sister. It's been two months since the transfer, and everything looks good. In the early century, futurists said we would soon be creating designer babies, that human genetic engineering would let us become a different species, taller, smarter, stronger. It hasn't quite worked out that way. Genetic modifications are all around us, from house cats and grapevines to the production cells in a poultry bioreactor. And we can treat dozens, hundreds of genetic disorders and mediate many of what were once called diseases of civilization, from obesity to depression. But there are still many mysteries remaining about humans. Creative intelligence, courage, curiosity, empathy, and more. We don't really understand how these arise. Even simpler traits like hair color or height are complicated enough genetically that to wade in and start moving around gene sequences is still a little too unpredictable. It is a form of surgery. And just as with neural implants, a good result is not guaranteed. Your father's generation was among the last to have randomly selected genomes. Now it's different. Physicians like to say that parents make the single biggest health decision in their child's life long before the child is born. Do you gamble with natural conception or use science to benefit your baby? In 2055, in vitro gametogenesis was finally approved for standard conception, which lets doctors create both eggs and sperm from parent stem cells. Current practice creates about 5,000 eggs. Combined with either natural or IVG sperm, that yields at least 1,000 zygotes to scan for an optimal natural recombination. I smiled. Can I at least see the facial rendering from the zygote scan? Ah, his son says, they don't give you the rendering anymore. People take it too literally, and then if the baby isn't an exact match, they think a mistake has been made. <laughs> so that is three tiny bits of an optimistic future. And I will take a seat, and let's have a talk. OK. Thanks, Michael. So I just want to say a, a few words. I want to kind of bring Michael to Rice and bring this issue uh, here as well. Um, Aldous Huxley, after whom we've named the, the topic, had a brother named Julian Huxley. Julian was an evolutionary biologist. Aldous, of course, was a consummate humanist, a novelist, and they were brothers. They, they spoke, they talked, they, they loved each other. 
Uh, Julian wrote a book called Evolutionary Humanism. So I think this, this linking of the humanities and the social sciences and the sciences is really useful here. Aldous was also really important to California, um, where you're from. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've worked a lot with Aldous's um, novels and his, his, former, his wife, his passed away wife, who, who was still alive a few years ago. And I know that Aldous was very regretful that everybody read his dystopian novel and nobody read his utopian novel. You've never even heard about his utopian novel. You probably don't even know the title. It's called Island. It appeared in 1962, 1963. Brave New World appeared in the early 30s. Aldous did not think what is in the novel uh, when he passed away. He, he thought what he put in Island, and he was deeply disturbed that nobody paid attention. So I think the question I want to ask uh, Michael, I read email from the future, and I put it down happy, you know, um, which is not a normal reaction for a vision of the future. When you turn on your television or watch Netflix, they're all really, really bad. This, this is the genre of horror, mm -hmm. essentially. These are dystopian visions of, of the future. Yours is a very mm -hmm. utopian vision, and I guess I want to, I want to ask you about that and, and the role of California in that, that utopianism, not, not in a uh, simplistic sense, but in a kind of deep, kind of existential sense. I, I really pick up this this um, positive view of the future from from your work. So I guess that's mm -hmm. the, that's the question that I really, really want to put on the table. Yeah, I've really puzzled why the utopian novel has fallen out of favor because it was, you know, it's one of actually the oldest novelistic forms there is, and was quite popular up till the uh, really end of the 19th century. A couple utopias were written uh, in the 20th century, like Herland, which is an amazing feminist utopia, um, an island, uh, but never achieved that much popularity. But I've never been one to seek popularity. So, well, I'm going to write a utopia. Um, I think one interesting thing that happened, I read every utopian novel. Once you get to the end, of the 19th century, we'd pretty much explored the whole world physically. So that meant that the way that all the old utopias were done, which was, oh, here it's contemporary time, but we have uh, just met a sailor in a pub in London who's uh, discovered an island where he lived for six months, and it was a utopia, and he tells us all about it. It's always uh, a mountain plateau that no one has been to for thousands of years that this civilization is. So that was always sort of the trope that was used for how we're seeing this completely different society. Uh, once we got to the 20th century, you couldn't really say this was, I mean, interestingly, Aldous Huxley is probably one of the last to use the sort of, quote, undiscovered uh, mm -hmm. contemporary island for, uh, for his utopia. But we, in the 20th century, we had to turn to time travel. So we had to go forward in time, and that meant technology. And I think that it is that introduction of technology and imagining the future of technology that triggers in us some kind of extra fear and anxiety, um, aside from what the old utopias did, which was really not much talk about technology. It was talking about how to reorder a fair and just society. So that's one of my theories. The other theory I have is that perhaps um, when times are seem as threatening as they do now, we like to read that it could even be worse, <laughs> and it makes us feel better. <laughs> so those are, those are my two theories, but I still think utopias are valuable. Uh, and uh, my book continues to sort of sell by word of mouth, and the fact is people have that same reaction. <laughs> they find it calming, and it makes them happy. Whether that is a social good in the long term, I don't know, but I'll settle for it for this book. So, the two things that bring down the utopia in Ireland, uh, one is oil and gas, by the way, it's the energy industry, mm -hmm. uh, and the other is religious fundamentalism. And so it's a combination of, of a kind right. of scientific and, and religious, religious forces that right. come together to destroy, destroy the island, as it were. You address certainly the oil and gas, the, the, the energy, the climate change issues very directly in the book. Can you, can you say a few words about that? Uh, 
Yes, my feeling was in the book that we sort of need a change of global consciousness uh, that, uh, and that that may well happen to us as a species as we get into the latter part of the decade. And, um, you know, I, I travel all over the world and I don't think I've been in any country or city in the last two years where they say, the weather is really crazy and it will get crazier. And at some point, perhaps that uh, overwhelms uh, the, uh, the sort of reticence that society seems to have now about tackling the climate crisis head on. So that's sort of what I theorize. Uh, and I focus very much on Gen Z and, the, and their younger brothers and sisters because they are the ones, I think, who will uh, really be the ones who look at society as it is and realize it needs to be rearranged. You know, your California question is interesting because, of course, uh, Island, the other element that it has is psychedelic drugs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm thinking, I promised Luis not to be weird. How can <laughs> So I, I wasn't going to bring up psychedelics, but I mean, Aldous Huxley and psychedelics go together. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, quite literally. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I, I do think there is a uh, sort of an optimism in California. It may yeah. be declining now, yeah. but later I'm going to talk about how uh, you know the early days of the personal computer revolution were extremely idealistic and really, really informed by the counterculture. And indeed, if you look at sort of futurists uh, who are professional futurists for big corporations, one finds that there's a little bit more of a California style, mm -hmm. which tends to be more optimistic. The uh, Institute for the Future in Palo Alto is an old, very well-known futurist group that I've worked with, and they are actually I find more optimistic than their counterparts in the East Coast. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's something to that. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. We could get away with it without without saying it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's okay. I'm I'm a writer, so I've got <laughs> and and I grew up a Rolling Stone. So my mentor took LSD to calm down. His name was Hunter. Um, <laughs> really? Really? Oh, that's another conversation. <laughs> um, Luis, I think we're out of time. I think. We want to be a good time, so thank you, Michael, very much. Certainly. This was really great. We have a lot to talk about off-site. Off thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>